when you understand Nehemiah's life, he was a um, um, armor bearer, if you would, a uh, what, what's that other word? A cup bearer for the king Artaxerxes in Syria, which I believe is around south uh, west of Jerusalem in that area in, in in captivity, pretty much a slave, if you would. His job was simply to drink and eat before the king, and if he didn't die, then he got to keep his job. It was kind of simple, but yet he grew close to the king. There was a connection that he made with the king, and Artaxerxes appreciated him. He got word that his hometown, Jerusalem, lay in shambles. You know, and this is one of those things that hits me whenever a tornado or, or a flood or something, when it's close to your hometown and people you know, it affects you. And he heard that the walls had fallen down, and, and he gives this report uh, when he went there to take care of it, and there was an enemy, and the enemies hate for you to ever rebuild. They hate for you. And I, I remember preaching on this a couple of years ago because we were rebuilding as a church and having to come back together. I had some missionaries that came to church today. They actually live at the end of, of uh, Baptist Encampment Road, and I always called them a commune because I always saw a bunch of cars out there and stuff. Actually, it's three missionary couples, elderly couples that have been all over the world that have preached the gospel, and, and they, they, they do video uh, gospel out for Uganda and in Pakistan and India and other places like that. And I'm amazed they live right down the road. Well, they, they, we got their chairs by accident uh, delivered to us. Uh, thank you, whoever <laughs> delivered them. And then uh, FedEx, I think, dropped them off there. Well, they had to come and get them, which forced us to connect. And so now we're getting to talk. And they said, you know, we've had some friends that come down here. We don't know anything about you. And I said, you are a commune down there. And they laughed. They said, no, we're just three old couples that are living in this great big three-story house down there. You know, we're good. No, we're not a commune. They laughed. And then I said, well, let me show you around the property. They're so excited. We rode around and they, gave me, they told me gospel stories. And we, we connected. We knew people. I knew people they knew from years ago. And then as I rode around, I said, you know, Joseph's there and David's over there and Ramirez is there. And my boys are here and I live here. And, and then he looked at me and he said, Who's calling who a commune around here? You know, I mean, <laughs> looks to me like you're the one with a commune. And it hit me. Yeah, I guess we are kind of a communal uh, outfit over here. In, in understanding this, when, when they, they also flooded May the 7th, just like we did. And so they walking through the same thing. It, it, when it hits home, it means something. It did for um, Nehemiah. So there are enemies, though, that did not want to see Jerusalem rebuilt because they had access in and out without any stopping them from going in and out. One of them was Sanballat. And when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? And can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Now, let me back up here and show you some spiritual implications here. In our own lives, when our walls are torn down, the enemy wants to know, uh, what are we doing? Will we restore the wall? In other words, will our own lives, will we get them restored? Will we get them back? My prayer is for this joy to come back into all of our lives and to get this excitement back for the house of God. And, you know, the, I, don't, I, I feel it on Sunday. We just need to keep it resonating in our lives. Will they offer sacrifices? Will we give? Will we make a, a sacrifice to make sure that, that these walls can be put back up will they finish in a day can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are Tobiah the Ammonite who was at his side said what are they building even if a fox climbed up on it it would break down the walls he was he was being uh, insulting to them the walls of stones hear us to begin the prayer of Nehemiah O oh, our God for we are despised Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people work with all their heart. In my heart, we're about half height as a church. We've been growing and things have been happening, but then you hit that plateau and people start getting tired. They start laying back some, and we're about half height. And I believe that there's more height that we got to go. We got to keep reaching a little bit more. And we're going to reach, you know, Saturday. I got a wedding and a funeral on the same day. Not Saturday, on the 15th, June 15th. You know what June 15th is, Sam? That's a day that many of us are going to go to Sulphur, Louisiana. 120 miles to hear David Huff and all his brothers play in a band without him knowing we're coming. Yeah, so I'm going to let y'all in on a little something that nobody else knows just yet. All right, so we're going to do it. So I got to do a wedding and a funeral and then go to Sulphur. Is it already online? Oh, they, they ain't listening. David Huff don't watch me. 
Yeah, I don't mind everybody. It, it, it's just going to be fun to walk in on because I love David like that. But there's so many things going on. We've got a lot of stuff happening. But what about half height? The Century Bible says, can they bring the uh, stones back to life from piles and trash and ashes? The NIV says, can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish that are burned one, at one time? Now, in our own lives, I'm going to tell you, there are, t- there, there are fires that hit you. They will burn you up, and they'll almost try to burn you out. And you've got to decide, God, am I going to be revived? Am I going to come back? God always builds with stones. I, and I learned this principle a long time ago. I've been in churches where it looked like bricks. Where everybody looked like cookie cutters. Everybody was dressed the same. And so by, by the way, my friend posted something and it really hit me. Everybody dressed like Pee Wee Herman. You that little tight, little skinny suit, you know, and a little skinny outfit, and a little vest and stuff. They all look like Pee Wee Herman. And that's what all the preachers are looking like now. And it starts looking like little bricks everywhere. This is bricks. Everybody's got bricks. But God never builds with bricks, right? He always builds with stones. God takes stones because stones are unique. Stones have, 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 have edges on them. That they, when you build with stone, it's, it takes a little more work. Uniformity is so easy. Try to make everybody march the same, act the same. That's, you know, I understand military and I understand militant. But I also understand that God gives us all the ability to be stones, to move, to move into a place. The scripture says in, in Peter, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, even he is a stone, by men, by chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices, accepting to God through Christ Jesus. Living stones being built up in a house. So that's what church is. That's why sometimes you say, you know, I don't fit with that one right there. That's why you change pews. That's why you rotate. That's why, you know, and I can look around the church and I can tell who fits with who because they, they kind of sit together, hang out together. But the truth of the matter is, this, this is who we are. So we, we're starting to connect and grow together and come up. And at the time of writing, Jerusalem was known as the city of God. And now it's in shambles. According to Nehemiah 1.3, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Let me go back to the stone real quick i'm so glad that god uses stones it's one of those set free moments when you realize that you can be a stone you're not a brick you come into church you look around and you say to yourself i'm not like any of these people rejoice that you're not like any of these people you're different god made you a stone amen but a lively everybody say lively not dead made to worship made to do something so now we look at jerusalem we see it's torn down it's 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 a pile heap jerusalem it resembles many of the hearts and lives of people who are ambassadors for Christ, but assaulted by the enemy. The city at this point is basically a, a pile of trash. Even today, when you look at the church from the outside with all its mistakes and faults and failures, you, you know, you, you have to look and say, there's times this looks like, it looks like a heap of rubble. And by the way, I've used a stat before and told you that, that 70%, I think, of the churches in America are under 100 people. Well, you know, that's not a bad stat, by the way. The more I thought about it, my son Judah said to me, he said, Dad, don't you realize all the little towns has got all the little churches, and that's the biggest churches they can have, and those are, those are big churches in some of those towns. And I went, whoa, son, rebuke your daddy. Amen. It's not a bad thing to see churches everywhere, but, but to see that, because he said that to me after I mentioned yesterday there were 400,000 churches in America. He was listening. It makes me happy somebody's listening somebody's catching it but he said dad that's not really all a bad thing because all them little towns need a church can I get an amen? amen so i got some good news god is not going someplace else to find new shiny stones to build his kingdom i said he's not going somewhere else he's still going to use us we will stay with what and who are, that god originally chose here the little country church and understand god if you want to build with us then build with us we want to build here stones were used as memorials Yesterday when I was at the cemetery, I looked and I saw and I mentioned that, that to, to write means to inscribe, to describe, to subscribe, prescribe. All those stones there had, been, uh, had inscriptions written on them. They, they were used for memorials. And most of the time, if you look across the cemetery, you realize that all the stones were different. Everybody has a unique uh, gravestone, something just a little bit different there. Also, they were used for throwing into the enemy to claim it, to throw into the enemy's land. Second Kings 3.19 you will overthrow every fortified city and every major town. You will cut down every good tree, stop up all the springs, and ruin every good field with stones. It's, it was one of the things the enemy would do. You, you've traveled. You've seen the stones, the, the, the walls, or excuse me, the fences made out of stones. 
And you ask yourself, where did all them stones come from? Well, they gathered them out of the fields. And they built fences out of the stones. And even in America, there are places where you see it. Mainly you see it overseas. England, places like that. You'll see stones. But they gathered them out. But the enemy would often take stones and throw them out into a field to say, that's my field. In other words, it's like saying dibs. It's like licking a Volkswagen and saying that's yours. You know what I'm saying? Hey, Amen. I wouldn't do a Volkswagen. <laughs> Forgive me. I, that, those are pretty useful. Anyway, but, but he'd throw the stone out into the field, and he said, that's mine now. So uh, they also used to build the temple. All through Scripture, we read the temples were built with stone. Now, I'm not going to read all this, but they were costly stones. They were, they were very costly when they would build them. They would get the precious stones. So the original condition of these stones that they built with, they were made from limestone. The stones were gathered out of the different fields. And we all come from different fields. Everybody here came from a different nationality or a different place. We came from different fields. We came from the fields of the fatherless, the fields of the abused, the rejected, the outcast, the molested, the poor. We came from all kind of fields. When you get to hear stories, matter of fact, when I listened to that man's story yesterday, at the memorial service in Highlands, as Joe was sharing about the, the bomb going off, and uh, he actually lost his arm. Then I looked over at another Vietnam vet, and I said, what would you think of that? And he looked at me as stone-faced as he could, and he said, we all got a story. And it really hit me. And he wasn't, he wasn't disgracing the story he heard. He was saying, we all got a story. Amen. We all got a story to share from where we came from. The past condition of these stones, they represented the first impression. Before a visitor or a foreigner ever saw the inside of the kingdom, they saw first these massive walls with each stone strategically set in its place. We've all seen uh, the castles and the giant walls and things like that. When you see these giant walls, Jericho, you could ride chariots side by side on the walls of Jericho, the tops of the walls. That's the thickness of the walls or, or how they had built them. It may have been hollow inside where they moved through it, but they, when they brought the walls up, they were so fortified. That's why and the Israel looked at him. They said, how are we going to bring Jericho down? What are we going to do? And of course, God had a plan with the shout and the walking around the walls. But the bottom line was you could run on top of those walls. You could move on top of them. They were very impressive. Stones say that. Amen. The first thing guests see are the stones here. They meet them at the door, in the parking lot, in the hallway, amen, and they recognize what's going on. And so it's important for us to stay vibrant, amen, and to be precious and unique to God. They represented the strength of the city. The stronger the walls, the stronger the city, amen. It represented defense. Our walls save us. The Bible says we enter his gates with thanksgiving, with praise. We come in the gates. So when we come into church, whether you realize it or not, as you're walking through the doors and you come through that door there, you're coming into a gate. You're coming into a place to praise. You've walked up, you've, you've moved past the security, and you've moved into here. Psalm 24, 9, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Gates represent entrance, exit, openings, closing, things you allow, things you disallow. Amen. Things you permit and things you prohibit. It was a place of defense. That's why Nehemiah said, we got to get the gates back up. we got to get the walls back up. we got to get, we got to fortify this place again and make it strong. The, the stones here, they had been weakened through the fire. When you go through the fire, uh, the stones did. It, it, they lost their durability and their vitality. And the reason was the moisture evaporated out of them. It. It's hard to look at a, at a brick or a rock or a stone and realize there's moisture in there. But, but there is. And if the moisture is extracted, then all of a sudden it dries up. And you and I, being stones, when we go through the fire, if we're not careful, we dehydrate. It, it sucks the, the life out of us. And all of a sudden, we're gloomy. We're sad. We're beat down. We're tired. We're fatigued. We can't do anything. Amen. And God's saying, listen, I'm living water. If you take of me, I'm going to help you out here. If you drink from me, I'll get you joy back in your life. And isn't that what we're after? I, 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 yeah, it's not the length of life I'm after. It's the strength of life. I want to enjoy life. I want to enjoy my friends, my family, my church. I want to see the worship in the house. Yeah, uh, honor God with all that we do. There's something about it. So to understand that God can come back in our own life, amen, and begin to rebuild us. Now, there's always going to be an enemy. There's always going to be somebody that's going to say something. Nehemiah 4.2, it says, Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? I was told yesterday, and I, I posted it because I, I actually found it a little bit humorous. But for years, every time I go preach this meeting over at Memorial in Highlands, there's a group of people that don't like me. 
and they'll stay seated when I say stand, and they'll stand when I say seat, and uh, they're just going to do the opposite. And they've told Jeff, the former owner, we don't like him, don't have him back. And the next year, Jeff will have me back, and, and they show up anyway. You'd think if I was going to be there, they just wouldn't show up, but they got to show up. But, but it, it just didn't bother me. It just like uh, it's when, when you realize that there's an enemy, when there's somebody that don't like, it, it's not, if you knew me, you'd like me. You just don't know me. You just hear me preach, and you don't like the gospel I'm preaching. You think in a memorial service, I should mention Jesus. Do you think these men and women who died, died for an atheist nation? Come you on. think they gave everything they had, amen, for, for, for a, a Muslim nation or a Hindu nation? No, this place was founded on Christianity. These people love Jesus. Amen, if they didn't when they got there, they did before they left. Amen. They begin to shift their own life. So the, the, the enemy, will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish? Uh, how about their own people? There's a time you have to be careful. You look around and say, you know what? I, I'm starting to agree with the enemy here. This ain't nothing but rubbish around here. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said the strength of the laborers is given out. There's too much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Sometimes you have to, again, hit a reset, back away, and then start over again. Rubbish is powder, dust, or ashes as a result of being pulverized to reduce through crushing. The devil is saying, I've pounded them too much. They will never come back. You can't build a church with this bunch. I say you can. I say we can build as much as God wants us to build. Amen. And we can come back out of this thing. Amen. It's in need. The need of his revival. We don't talk about it much, but we need to be revived. All of us need to be revived. We need to be revived in our families, in our homes, in our marriages, in our, with our children as we move through life. That, God, you revitalize us. Bring us back again, back to life. And God can replace the moisture in the bone. The prophetic purpose of these stones, and I'll start closing with a few thoughts here. Ephesians 2.20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the things that they've preached. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. What we've gone through in life builds us together. It puts us together. You know, I'm glad to see Craig here tonight, by the way. Uh, we've gone through things together. There's, you know, as you move through life, it, it, there are things that you say, you know, that's my brother, that's my sister. We've, built, we've been built, we've gone through. And God takes burned out people just burned out and refreshes them and rebuilds with them and and this is my prayer that god will take us and rebuild us amen bring us back with more vitality more strength more excitement amen in our lives nehemiah 4 nehemiah said therefore i stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places posting them by families with their swords spears and bows after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles and officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers. Fight for your... This sounds like a Braveheart sermon, don't it? Fight for your brothers. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Your wives and your homes. I think that's where they stole it from. When our enemies heard that we were unaware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. And as we recognized over the, the, this last weekend, our men and women fought for their mothers and their fathers and their brothers and their sisters and their daughters and their sons and their nation. You know, and so I say that, again, I, it's, still, it's still a residue up, upon me as I move throughout this week. I can't forget what has happened and what's gone on in the lives of the men and the women of which I've connected with over the last few years. And I stand here and I tell you as a church and a pastor, I believe the wall's about halfway. We got a little more work to do. We're not finished yet. Amen? Amen. Amen. Stand with me. Let me reiterate something, too. I love this church. I love this house. I believe that we'll be packed out again on Sunday, as we have been previously. Uh, see it again out in the North Campus. You know, it's kind of a unique thing that God has blessed us with. I pray also that many of you get rested up over the summer. And you find time for vacation. You time to find time to connect with people. And you take somebody out to eat. Amen. And you visit with them. Amen. And you talk with them. And you pray for your pastor. Amen. Thank you, please. Amen. We live in an environment of privilege, don't we? We're so privileged. Over the next few months, I'll be, again, on uh, social media, 
you'll, you'll catch me on Tuesday nights. We're going to try to set it where we can load things on. So it's like if you went on at 8 o'clock on Tuesday night, you're going to hear your pastor speaking. Now, I might be on a lawnmower. I might be in a swimming pool. I might be on the side of a mountain in North Carolina. Amen. I might, but I'm going to be somewhere, and I'm going to be sharing the gospel with you. Amen. There'll be a, uh, an excerpt. To, just one way or another, we're going to figure out how to get this done. And we're going to get it out among the people. We're going to keep sharing. Amen. Father, I thank you that you've taken us, who was at times rubble, pulverized, beat down and crushed. And you revitalized us. And you seem to continue to do that. You continue to bring us back from, the, from, from death, Lord, when it seemed like we were just on the edge of slipping away. God, I pray for strength in this house. I pray for blessing upon your people. I pray over the next few months there would be a revitalization, Lord, in the hearts and the lives of the people of this house. And God, that we would see people fishing for others, going after others, witnessing and bringing them into this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love you guys. God bless you.